So um, welcome everyone to the Women of Science Week. Uh, this week is an exploration of women in STEM, uh, including the research, uh, any challenges that they have faced, and the ways in which they aim to help create opportunities for other women in their fields. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to let you all know that the speaker will be accepting questions during the talk. Uh, you can type any questions that you may have into the Q&A window, and I will field them uh, for Ms. Berger. Without further ado, I, it is with pleasure that I will introduce Ms. Sabrina Berger. She's a physics graduate student and a McGill University PhD candidate. Uh, today, she'll be speaking to us about how radio waves are being used by astrophysicists to study the universe. Okay, great. Can I get started? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you again for this invitation to speak at such an awesome event. Um, I'm really excited to, to see something like this going on um, in Montreal. So uh, again, I'm uh, Sabrina Berger. I'm a physics graduate student at McGill. And uh, I titled this talk, Fast Radio Bursts in Me, because although I'll be talking about my science, I also wanted to kind of weave out uh, what actually got me interested in this very specific field um, and, and, and why I chose to study science in the first place. So this is, um, we'll be discussing this more later, but this is kind of a 2D projection of the universe onto your computer screen. And you can see the FRBs uh, or fast radio bursts going off as these like bursts of light all over, all over the sky which I'll be talking about in just a little bit, but I think that's a really beautiful visualization um, and maybe uh, exemplifies how mysterious these bursts are. So um, kind of an outline for my talk, I'll go through what I like to call my tumultuous and thrilling path into science because although it's been very fun and exciting, there's definitely been a lot of challenges um, and uh, a lot of times when I question whether or not I actually wanted to uh, take this path. And then I'll talk about what radio astronomy is. Um, so astronomy, like most of us know, is, is the study of outer space and all the mechanisms uh, and astrophysics too. So there's astronomy and astrophysics. Astronomy tends to mean more of the observational side of looking, into, looking at the stars, but um, and then astrophysics dealing with both the physics and astronomy. But I'll be talking more specifically about a subfield of both those two, radio astronomy, and then also fast radio bursts. So what are they and how do we find them? Um, and then also a few things I wish I knew when I embarked on my journey through science. So I'll end with, with some kind of personal anecdotes on that. So I wanted to start by asking this question, um, why was I initially drawn to science? Uh, I, it was fun to kind of think about this again because I don't often times uh, think about the, the kind of first uh, ideas that drew me to this field. But um, growing up, I was really curious about why things worked. I was always asking too many questions, sometimes annoying my parents. They were like calling me the 20 questions game if you've ever played that. Um, and I, I don't think I was thinking about this in the moment, but I, I definitely wanted a career where this was a desirable trait. Um, and I was also really intrigued um, or intrigued into uh, thinking about maybe science as a career, especially um, because I, I wanted to know um, more about life beyond our own planet and, and whether it existed and, and kind of how people were studying that. So now I'll discuss a little bit um, about my path into science. So I actually grew up in California um, near San Francisco, about 45 minutes east of San Francisco. And um, I spent most of my childhood interested in kind of the arts. I was really interested in music and theater and I figured I'd end up as a musician and, and go to music school. Um, so, uh, that kind of all changed um, when I studied abroad in um, Italy in my third year of high school. 
So I didn't actually like high school too much. I didn't have very many friends and I was pretty shy and introverted um, and spent most of my time just kind of by myself. But this year abroad um, really kind of gave me that push to come out of my shell and, and I made a lot of friends. Um, and, I, and I oftentimes think about this year as, as giving, me, giving me some um, of the resilience that I needed to continue in science um, because uh, there were a lot of moments that were very challenging being abroad and in this very isolated town where most people had never seen an American and no one spoke English and having to kind of learn Italian and um, make new friends is difficult. Um, and it was also really cool because my host father, so the father of the family that I lived with um, was an astronomer. So this is Totoy. Um, and he and I would spend a lot of time discussing um, different uh, parts of astronomy that he was interested in, um, kind of what was going on in the field. And um, he actually uh, was, was someone that kind of piqued my interest in astronomy more than, than I realized, uh, realized was there. And so I still kind of had in the back of my mind that I wanted to become a musician, but I was thinking, well, okay, um, this astronomy stuff sounds really cool. I could always maybe fall back on that. Um, I don't really know anyone who's in science or professor or how you even make a career in this field, but I'll see. So then I came back to California and I decided rather than going to my last year of high school, I would take a test and graduate early. And so I went to a community college, which is like a two-year institution before you, um, before transferring to a four-year institution. I don't think they have the equivalent in Canada, but this is a common thing um, in the United States. And so I did my last year of high school there and I actually went to a college advisor. And um, so at this community college, there were a lot of classes that they didn't have at my high school. So I was able to kind of get started um, and had to kind of choose what, what path I wanted to go on. So I went to my college advisor and I told her I wanted to do both music and astronomy. I was kind of torn between the two. I couldn't decide. And she told me, oh, okay, well, you really need to pick one. You can't do both. Um, she was completely wrong. I wish I hadn't listened to her, but um, I ended up thinking, okay, well, I can keep doing music on the side um, as a hobby and I'll study more seriously at school. Um, for, for astronomy and physics, which is something that um, you need to usually have a formal degree in to, to make a career in. So then I spent two years um, at this community college and then I transferred to UC Berkeley in 2015 into their astrophysics and physics program. So while at UC Berkeley, I uh, actually had a lot of difficulties um, but I'm going to show kind of my highlights. Um, so a lot of these photos are, are some of my best moments that, that kept me going in science, but I definitely struggled with the fact that uh, the department was super intense and um, there are a lot of people just kind of pushing each other around to, to get the best grade in class. And, and it was a very competitive kind of environment, which was not something that I was used to and that I'd seen in science before. Um, so these are, this is actually a picture from one of my first classes at UC Berkeley. I think it was my like third semester modern, or my third semester of introductory physics classes. So it was like a modern physics class. We were learning, um, I think about light um, and special relativity maybe. And so uh, this was, I'm showing only pictures of, of people that have really been good mentors and advisors to me. So this was uh, one of my great TAs, his name is Zach Fisher, and he's explaining a concept to us. Um, and I actually didn't do very well in this class. I uh, struggled a lot. It was my first class that I took, physics class that I took at UC Berkeley. And I remember after the class thinking, oh, uh, I must not be cut out for this. I didn't do as well as I had been doing before in my previous classes. Um, but nevertheless, I continued. Um, so this is simultaneously while taking my first class, I was also doing a research project um, 
in experimental astrophysics. And we were basically trying to build a detector um, to detect gravitational waves. So um, maybe you've heard about uh, in the news the, the waves that kind of Einstein predicted, um, but from the very early universe. So um, this was a, it's called a doer. It's a cryogenic device. And because uh, temperatures and thermal effects affect different parts of the telescope, especially the electronics a lot and, and the measurements that, that we can make. Um, we were trying to, we would, we would kind of test the components of the telescope by putting them in this, in this uh, cooling chamber. Um, and this was broken. Um, and I actually was never able to fix it. Uh, they just kind of handed it to me and were like, okay, go fix this. And I did learn a lot about how doers work but um, I, I didn't end up making it work ever. So uh, I think that this project definitely made me realize that I don't want to be working on kind of this experimental physics side of things. So this is a picture of me in one of my favorite classes and a class that made me realize that I do want to work in maybe electronics or with circuitry. So uh, I built one of uh, like an automatic guitar tuner which was really expensive online at the time. So you could kind of pluck a note and uh, then you would put the uh, electric guitar tuner on the tuning peg and, and it would tune the guitar for you. And um, that was a really fun project. And be really, I remember being really excited when I, when I actually was able to finish that. And it felt, felt really cool being able to use physics directly um, to, to create something that, that I could use um, and, and was really tangible. So um, also while at UC Berkeley, so I, I did that other project um, in the lab where I was working on trying to fix this, this cooling device, but what really kind of, uh, I guess solidified in me the most that I wanted to continue in research in astrophysics, especially was working on a exoplanet project with Leslie Rogers, who was a postdoc at UC Berkeley. She's now a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, and she was a really, really great mentor to me. I actually still talk to her today. Um, and I think I had a lot of not so great research advisors while I was an undergrad, um, but she was exceptional and really was always been there uh, for me in, in my academic career so far. And just briefly, so, um, I wanted to just show a kind of culmination plot for my work that I did with her. So uh, I was modeling rocky planets like our Earth um, that are so mostly larger than ours actually um, because, because those are frequently observed um, with a lot of our exoplanet hunting telescopes. So this plot just kind of shows um, the percent difference. So how much bigger a planet would be from a constant temperature planet um, using more realistic temperature profiles. So hotter, um, 3000 Kelvin, um, super, super hot, uh, constant, constant profile, whereas 300 Kelvin is uh, like a room temperature planet. So I was looking at how um, temperature affects this modeling. And, and that was a really, really fun project, but um, I ended up not going into exoplanets, um, which I'll discuss in, in the next few slides. So this is just a graduation picture of me. So despite all of these challenges um, while an undergraduate, especially dealing with mental health, super competitive environment and being a transfer student, I still was able to graduate. Sometimes I felt like I was hanging by a thread, but um, I ended up finishing. And um, now that leads me more into uh, kind of what radio astronomy is and uh, how, how I got into it in the first place. So while I was still an undergraduate, I found a radio astronomy research internship through um, SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And they have a big SETI Institute at Berkeley. Um, and I'm not sure if maybe you might have heard about through the screensaver that you can download, um, where you can actually 
they can they'll send data to your computer and your CPU will will do data processing for them. So so they found a way to kind of harness the computational power of people's computer from all over the world. Um, so this is like a screenshot from the screensaver, um, but it, but it's since actually been taken down sadly. But that was kind of how they rose to fame and were able to do data processing um, so so efficiently and um, without the need for for huge supercomputers. So um, another great mentor, like who are all these people popping up? Um, this is uh, a post, another postdoc, um, Dr. Vishal Gajar, who was also a great mentor for me. And uh, together we worked on a SETI, so this search for, for artificial signals from, from outer space and a fast radio burst pipeline um, for this huge and new uh, telescope in China. So this is the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope in China. It's the largest radio telescope in the world. This is a side view of it and it looks kind of like a monstrosity to me. Um, so really beautiful. So we worked on developing um, a pipeline to look for, for these two types of signals um, for, for this telescope. Um, but we never actually went there. So it was actually completely from California, uh, just writing the software and um, working out everything um, from, from afar. And then, then we did have some people from our group go there and install the system and everything. So that's what first uh, kind of introduced me to radio astronomy, but, but I should take a step back and actually explain what radio astronomy is in the first place. Um, I remember when I was first learning about light, I, I kept seeing this diagram over and over again. Um, and, it, and it never really uh, occurred to me how important it was until I, I guess I started studying radio astronomy. So this is the atmospheric opacity. So how much of light uh, from can actually pass through the Earth's atmosphere. And so you can see that most invisible light can, um, but we actually have to put telescopes um, into the upper atmosphere that want to observe gamma rays, X-rays, and ultraviolet light, or even infrared. Um, but we're also able to observe radio waves, mostly unhindered um, through, through our own atmosphere. So we can, can leave uh, telescopes at the Earth's surface. Um, but then, of course, long wavelengths or, or super uh, low frequency radio wavelengths are still blocked. Um, so, so you can think of radio waves as kind of being um, the, the frequency of light that, that's used to uh, transmit um, the radio into your car, maybe. Um, so, so they tend to, they're much longer wavelengths than visible light, and, and we can't see radio wavelengths. It'd be really cool if we could, but we can't. Um, and radio telescopes, so the, the devices that we actually use to um, observe radio, radio waves come in many shapes and sizes. Um, I wanted to kind of show a bunch of beautiful telescope, radio telescope pictures in this talk just to give an overview. So uh, maybe if you're ever driving past one, you'll be able to say, oh, well, that's a radio telescope. I know what that does. Um, so this is the Sardinia radio telescope, which I actually never visited while I was studying abroad, but uh, it's cool to know that there was a uh, radio telescope um, on the small island that I was at in Italy. Um, and then this is a aerial view from the fast telescope that we saw in the previous slide. So you can see it's huge and it's kind of nestled into um, this hilly area. This is the Green Bank telescope in West Virginia. And it's the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. Um, and then this is Parks in Australia, um, which was really important um, to discovering some of the first few fast radio bursts. This is Arecibo Telescope in um, Puerto Rico, which is currently offline. Um, I think it was damaged during the hurricane season, which is really sad but it's, it's provided countless discoveries um, in radio astronomy so far. And then this is the Jodrell Bank Observatory. It's another kind of steerable uh, radio telescope, but I think uh, its axis of rotation is, is different than, than these two. 
So, okay, we've, we've seen um, some research going on here. So I starred this one, um, but the real kind of uh, radio telescope that I've been working with mostly um, in graduate school is a radio telescope called a radio interferometer. So these are a bunch of examples of radio interferometers. You might think, wow, they, they look pretty different. This one looks like a bunch of the single dish ones we saw just kind of uh, positioned randomly um, over, over a field. But what really makes radio interferometers so powerful is that they're able to um, kind of have an equivalent um, dish size. So, uh, observing observing dish kind of like the ones we saw for the single dish but rather than having to build a dish that's this big you can put your telescopes or or single dishes um a, a certain what we call baseline apart so a certain distance apart and you can have an equivalent sort of single dish radio telescope um to that size so it's really helpful when we want to localize things in space extremely precisely when we need our angular resolution or kind of how um, the largest angle or the, the smallest angle that we can separate between, between two objects in the sky when we want that to be really small. Um, we, we need these long baselines or distances between dishes. So this is, uh, it's called ALMA and it's in Chile. This is LOFAR in um, the Netherlands. So this one's always the funkiest looking interferometer to me. It just has these like panels on the ground. This is HERA in South Africa. Um, and uh, this is the very large array in New Mexico, which was the first instrument to actually be able to localize fast radio bursts really precisely. And it also has a bunch of steerable uh, radio dishes, as you can see. So um, then kind of the most important one um, for my research is, is this one called Chime. And it consists of these four cylindrical dishes, it kind of doesn't have the longest baseline compared to the other instruments you've seen. But um, what's really powerful about it is how the, these long cylinders allow for, for a really large field of view or area of the sky that you can see, see at one time. Okay, so yeah, so a little bit more about CHIME. Um, McGill is definitely kind of a hub for, for the CHIME fast radio burst effort. So it's really, it's really cool to be in Montreal um, where all this is going on. But CHIME itself is located at Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory um, in Penticton, British Columbia. And it observes lower frequencies, so wavelengths around 50 centimeters um, or 400 to 800 megahertz. Um, and it has, a, as, I really, as I said, a, a really large field of view. And so how it works, you might say, to actually look at objects is it uses the Earth's rotation um, to, to track the sky as, as the Earth turns. So it has this huge field of view. It's always on the sky, but of course the sky above Chime is not the same at all times. So it's able to um, kind of sweep through um, parts of, parts of uh, the sky like this. Oops. And it was actually originally designed to study the history of the universe. Fast radio bursts were kind of an afterthought. Um, and uh, it ended up being extremely powerful to look for fast radio bursts because of this large field of view that it has. So if you remember in the first slide where there were all these bright flashes coming up all over the sky, uh, you can imagine if, if we don't have a large area that we can observe with our telescope, then how will we be able to uh, pick up? We, our chances of actually observing um, one of those bursts is a lot less. So, um, okay, I gave kind of an introduction to radio astronomy. Feel free to ask any questions you might have um, about that, but I'll also uh, now talk a little bit more about um, the specifics of my research and um, looking into fast radio bursts. So, oops. okay, there you go. So what are fast radio bursts? 
um, they're these really highly energetic radio transients. So kind of let's unpack each of these words. So transients, um, meaning that they last just a few milliseconds. Um, so if your eye could see radio wavelengths, it would be the brightest thing on at the time. Um, but our eye can actually only observe things lasting at least 13 milliseconds. So it might be too fast and your eye might not even pick it up if you have a radio, wave, radio telescopes as eyes. So they're, they're really fast bursts and they're extremely bright, the brightest things in radio wavelengths at the time that they go off. Um, and they're these highly dispersed pulses, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and, and they also have an unknown origin. So we don't know exactly um, what's causing them yet. So what do I mean by dispersion? So I put for all of those people maybe in calculus or taking calculus, and that's okay if you haven't, it's totally fine. Uh, you can kind of think about this as being a sum, this integral. Um, so in technical terms, it's the integral of the electron density um, between us and the fast radio burst source. Um, and in a visualization kind of way, um, if you've ever shined light through a prism, you know that you can break it up into its different frequencies of light or different colors. And though in radio wavelengths, we don't necessarily have different colors of light, um, the same thing happens with the radio frequencies. And so uh, as the radio waves from the source travel through the intergalactic medium, there's a bunch of these are electrons. Um, that, it, that they bump into and it actually causes uh, different uh, frequencies of light to travel at different speeds. So I put this sum here because um, you can kind of think this, this DM is, is called a dispersion measure. And so you can think about this is the sum of all the electrons kind of in between us and the source of the fast radio burst. So adding them all up. Um, and it helps us understand um, potentially or, or kind of get some constraints on the distance to a fast radio burst. So um, that's what we mean when we say that they're dispersed pulses. So different parts of different frequencies of, from, the, from the fast radio burst are arriving at different times at our telescope. And that's another reason why they were actually so hard to find the first uh, observation wasn't until 2007 and, and people were really confused by this. Um, what is this crazy bright source that we've never observed before? Um, now, thanks to CHIME, we've observed more than a hundred fast radio bursts, which is really important to, to learning more about them, of course. Um, but, but the reason is, one of the main reasons that it, it was so difficult was, of course, we didn't have telescopes with this huge field of view and also um, that we didn't really have software in place to de-disperse, uh, oops, to de-disperse the signal as it came in. So this is a super astrophysicy, physical, I should guess I should say, um, plot of one of the most famous fast radio bursts. It's called fast radio burst 121102. This is the frequency um, of the fast radio burst, that, uh, the frequency of observation. Um, and so this is actually a repeating fast radio burst. And it was able to be localized with the very large array. So it was in the lower right corner of the interferometers that I showed. So it wasn't originally detected there, but because it repeats, um, we could point the VLA to where we think the fast radio burst is going off and kind of wait for it to repeat again so that we could get a localization with, with a better instrument. So as you can see, different higher frequencies of light are arriving at the telescope before lower frequencies. So there's this kind of dispersed quality to the pulse and we have to de-disperse the pulse. So this is the de-dispersed version and the dispersed um, to, to get the flux or the kind of intensity of, of the fast radio burst. So um, I told you about one uh, FRB that's been localized, but unfortunately we, we really haven't been able to localize very many of them. Um, so this is graphic. So there's there's fast radio bursts coming out from coming from all over uh, the universe, um, but we haven't been able to localize very many of them. Or the ones that we do observe with Chime um, aren't localized to the precision or well enough um, 
to to be able to uh, making make any sort of scientific meaningful scientific um, uh, claim about their about where they come from, and because we don't know where they are, uh, we need to know where they come from. So that that's kind of why uh, we need such a precise localization of these bursts. So um, that leads me into what fast radio bursts actually are. I think I saw a question from anonymous attendee about about what they what they are. Um, so the, the answer to that is, is we really don't know, but um, initially there are a bunch of crazy theories for why uh, fast radio bursts or, or what fast what was causing fast radio bursts. People were saying, okay, maybe there are these colliding extremely dense stars or, or neutron stars, which I'll discuss in a few slides, or maybe they're merging black holes. Um, and the reason actually SETI was interested in, in fast radio bursts was because they were thinking uh, it could be some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence, which it, it definitely is not. Um, but but that was uh, when when fast radio bursts were first being observed. Some people were were speculating that that might have been um, been what was causing them, but that's not true. Um, so on here, I haven't discussed magnetars, which are these really magnetic, highly um, magnetic neutron stars. They have these really really strong B fields. Uh, or, or you can think about like a really, really strong magnet kind of uh, that the star acts as. And we know for sure that some fast radio bursts come from magnetars because we've been able to observe a fast radio burst coming directly from a magnetar within our own galaxy. So we're sure that at least some part of the fast radio burst population comes from magnetars. Um, and we're still kind of uh, learning about the underlying mechanism that, that causes the burst within, within the star itself. Um, but so what exactly are magnetars? They're these really, really dense um, and highly magnetic neutron stars. So they're these like, uh, someone described um, kind of the sound that a magnetar would make. Um, one of the people in my research group was saying, oh, they're, they're like cracking and popping, like, they're just so uh, energized and um, kind of uh, fizzling in space. And um, so it's, it's really interesting that um, one teaspoon of material from a neutron star would actually weigh a billion tons. Um, and that's because although neutron stars only weigh about 1.5 times the mass of our own sun, they are only the size of a small city. So only about 15 to 20 kilometers in diameter. Um, so they're extremely small and, and very, very dense. Um, so there's lots of astrophysicists that just study neutron stars and the interiors of neutron stars. They're, they're kind of uh, astrophysical laboratories to study some of the um, high energies and densities that, that we can't really replicate on Earth. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of physicists are really interested um, in, in neutron stars, not only for the astrophysics part, but also for the fundamental physics. So um, the crux of the matter is um, we really don't know what these FRBs are, but to be able to know, we need to localize these fast radio bursts. And unfortunately, um, there's a lot of problems that come alongside with localizing them. Um, we're finding the most fast radio bursts uh, than any other telescope with CHIME, but um, we don't have enough, uh, we don't have enough, a long enough distance between kind of telescopes or what we call baseline in interferometry um, to localize the fast radio burst well enough. So CHIME is saying, okay, we're going to take care of this. We're going to add more sites. Um, so this is the original CHIME site in Penticton, um, this is the CHIME site, just about, I think, um, maybe 10 to 20 kilometers away, um, pretty close by. Um, and then we're also going to put another CHIME instrument um, in Algonquin National Park. And then also at the Green Bank Observatory, where you saw that Green Bank telescope, um, the, the largest steerable radio telescope, we're going to put uh, another CHIME cylinder or uh, telescope um, at the observatory because it has very low um, 
radio frequency interference um, because not very many people live there. It's pretty remote. So you can already see that, wow, the distances between these two telescopes are huge. That's gonna increase our localization power drastically. And we're gonna be able to localize um, FRBs to, to their galaxies, the galaxies that they come from and, and even within their galaxies maybe. Um, and you can see that, so the smallest angle that telescope can tell the difference between or what you might know as angular, resi angular resolution is about a wavelength of the light that you're observing over its baseline. So we know that the wavelength is about 50 centimeters um, and you could see, okay, if we put, if we divided 50 centimeters by thousands of kilometers, we're gonna be able to observe a really small angle. Um, and of course that's a really rough estimate because there's a lot of other factors that come into play, um, but, but that just kind of gives you an idea. Maybe you learn this as the Rayleigh criterion in, in your um, modern physics or electromagnetism class. Um, okay, so time is adding more sites. Um, oops, I accidentally went back one slide. But getting more into the research that I'm actually doing, just because time is adding more sites doesn't mean that localizing fast radio verse is going to be super easy. There's lots of problems. So this is the atmosphere, um, different parts of the atmosphere that you might have studied before. Um, and the key one here is the ionosphere, which affects uh, radio wavelengths and especially, especially uh, longer radio wavelengths. If you remember back to the electromagnetism spectrum that we saw, that we saw a few slides ago, you saw that long wavelengths exceeding a certain wavelength threshold were all cut off. Um, and couldn't make it through the Earth's atmosphere. So you'd have to move outside to actually observe them. But just because not all, just because radio waves are able to pass through the ionosphere doesn't mean that they're not affected by them. Um, and, and the ionosphere is, is uh, so like 200 kilometers above, above the Earth and, and where the Aurora Borealis kind of uh, takes place, if you've ever seen that before. Um, so, this is a video showing the effects of the ionosphere on a source. So you can see that if, if we want to localize this, this is not a fast radio burst, but say it were, this FRB, it's jumping all over the place due to the ionosphere um, causing, uh, kind of refracting and, and causing the light to bend as it, as it moves through that part of the atmosphere. So it makes it much harder to localize fast radio bursts. So 20 arc minutes, that might not make, might not uh, seem very important to you initially, but uh, 20 arc minutes is a lot larger than um, the scales that we want to localize these things at. It's more on the milli arc second. So orders of magnitude smaller than, than this, uh, than, than the, the height of, of this image. So you can see that the ionosphere really has um, a very annoying effect on, on the radio waves that pass um, through the atmosphere. So um, how do we deal with this effect? Um, it turns out that there are a couple different ways we can do this. Um, and and we, we work on this through uh, a part of observational astronomy called calibration. So that's where we have to correct for all the systematics of the telescope and the, atmos and the atmosphere. We have to make sure that those effects are kind of subtracted off or divided off um, before we can get our actual signal. And so we're able to use pulsars, um, which are these neutron stars that we talked about before emitting precise pulses. And uh, this doesn't show it so well, but if the pulse is pointing towards us or if it's angle of rotation happens to be that the pulse passes by the earth. Um, they're actually extremely um, precise and they can actually, they're referred to as kind of sometimes these, uh, these uh, astrophysical clocks because the time periods of the pulses are so precise and, and happen um, at, at such predictable times. So we can use pulsars to do some of this um, ionospheric or ionosphere uh, correction that I discussed. But the problem with pulsars is um, there aren't always 
uh, there isn't always a pulsar in the field of view uh, at the time that we need it. So we're not always able to have a pulsar that we know really well, that's well localized <clears throat> and that's bright enough. Um, we're, not, we're not able to always have one of those um, in our field of view at a given time. So the way that we're trying to get around this or maybe uh, use pulsars in adjacent with, with um, is this, um, is, is to use GPS satellites. So global positioning satellites. Your phone actually does this. Um, so I think your phone has a localization precision. So it can, it can tell where you are on earth, which is something like 10 to 15 feet. So, so it does have to do some ionis your correction because um, there, there is the radio wave being affected by the ionosphere as it passes and gets to your phone. Um, but the good thing about GPS satellites is there are 24 of them and they're always going to be in the field of view of uh, our time outriggers at any given time. So, so we can use them kind of like we do pulsars. They're really important, um, not only for localizing you on, on, on this planet, but they could also uh, be very important um, to localize a fast radio burst light years away. So how can we actually use these GPS satellites? So this hasn't been done to the extent that we're doing it at Chime previously. Um, so a GPS satellite sends a signal to GPS antenna on Earth. This is a GPS antenna in the McGill Physics building um, that I'm using. And so this little thing, it's like almost the size of my hand, will pick up a signal from the GPS antenna or multiple GPS antennas. And it'll actually pass through uh, a wire in the ceiling that goes to another room. Um, and it'll be input into, into these crates here <coughs> called like an analog to digital converter. Um, and the signal gets converted to something that a computer can read. So um, I won't go into the details of this. I honestly don't understand it very well, but that's for my um, kind of, uh, friends that are working on the nitty gritty of the electronics for Chime, but there are these boards that go into um, the crate. So each of these kind of slices you can see has one of these boards um, and you can plug it in and uh, it'll do that conversion for you so that you can read the data on your computer. So that's the way that we're studying GPS satellites um, and hopefully we don't actually know how well this is gonna work yet. This is ongoing research. Hopefully, eventually um, we'll be able to get some ionospheric correction using both pulsars and GPS satellites um, so that we can localize FRBs to precision um, that actually puts them within a galaxy. So we can get their position within a galaxy more easily and, and more precisely. So before I and um, that's a brief overview of my research and feel free to ask me any questions you have. But I also wanted to share a few things that I wish I knew um, when I had embarked on my journey through science just in the last three minutes, few minutes. Um, so of course, these are just my own personal opinions and uh, you should feel free to not take them, uh, just to take them as suggestions and, and not facts and of course, you'll carve your own way through science if you choose to do so. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, these are some things I wish someone had told me. So um, I think the first one is that grades really are not everything. I think I went into science thinking that I needed to have perfect grades all the time in every single class. And yes, they're very important, but and they can help you uh, get into graduate school, uh, get various internships, or research positions, but I don't think that getting a good grade in um, a class corresponds to how good of a researcher you will be. Doing research is, is so different than um, doing a problem set or doing homework. And um, just because you have perfect grades doesn't necessarily mean you like research and vice versa, I guess. Um, also, the prestige of a school does not equate to your happiness or success as a scientist. I think 
growing up, uh, actually maybe not growing up, but even later when I was an undergrad, I felt that um, I always need to be at the most prestigious school. And um, if I wasn't, then that would mean that I wouldn't be able to be successful. And that's really, really not true. And I think as I kind of discussed, I wasn't very happy uh, at UC Berkeley. And despite its prestige and everything, um, and I think I've seen the same in, in some of my friends as well, uh, just that it doesn't necessarily matter um, where you're going. It, it matters the kind of science that you do and the people that you meet um, around you. Um, and you won't necessarily be happier um, going to the most prestigious school in the world um, or even as successful necessarily. Though they do um, provide opportunities um, for, for successful science, that doesn't mean that, that that's the place that you have to be. So I also wanted to stress how important I think mentorship is. Uh, I mentioned a few of my mentors and uh, I also want to emphasize this good mentor aspect because I have had a lot of bad mentors um, over the years and mentors that brought me down and basically told me that I, uh, or, or told me that I wasn't kind of um, maybe set up for this field or, or wasn't good enough um, or needed to be a genius or something um, or I couldn't succeed. And that was just totally wrong. And they're no longer my mentors, um, but, but mentorship, good mentorship was really key in me I'm continuing in science and feeling like I belonged and um, could have someone to uh, talk to you about not just the science, but also um, the different parts of uh, the experience that come up as, as you go through um, your scientific career. So I think finding a good mentor is really, really important. Also seeking out opportunities and applying for them, even if you don't think that you'll get them. Um, I can't tell you, I, I think most of the internships I did in undergraduate and my undergraduate degree, I, I didn't think I would get, um, or even grad schools that I applied to. Um, I, I really think you shouldn't sell yourself short. And someone once told me, another graduate student said that you should always apply to things like you'll get them. And, and I think that, I think that's really good advice as well um, to, to approach things, um, in in the in the way you would if if you knew you would get them, um, and and put your best foot forward. Um, and then also, science should really be fun, and the environment where you do science matters a lot. I think this kind of relates back to the second bullet point. Um, I think whether or not science is fun, at least for me, has been very dependent on the people that I work with, and the environment that I'm in. Um, and whether I feel included and um, like my voice is heard uh, in the research. So you should feel like that. And there are always scientific groups um, that will make you feel like that. And you don't necessarily have to stay in a happy research group or environment or even maybe study group um, where you don't feel this way. Um, so I guess that maybe is obvious to some people, but uh, I think that sometimes I need to remind myself of that. And also that to not take everything so seriously. Of course, science is a very serious field, but it should also be really, really fun. Um, otherwise, what's the point of doing it? Um, yeah. So uh, also as corny as it sounds, I really think that believing in yourself is is important and not saying that you should have a huge ego or uh, be overconfident per se, but I think um, believing in yourself and believing that, that you can succeed, which you totally can, anyone on this, in, anyone on this call could, um, is really important and, and helps put you in the right mindset to do science well. So uh, that's it, but thank you so much for listening. And again, thank you for inviting me to speak here. That was really fun. Um, and then thanks to my wonderful current, so these are my current advisors at McGill um, and my past advisors.
And oh, this is just a little logo from the McGill Space Institute, which is the astrophysics department right next to uh, the physics building in at McGill. And if you're ever around, um, it's a cozy house. You can always stop by and ask questions or um, say hi to me or other, other students or professors uh, and feel free to email me. Um, yeah, and I'll take any questions now. Okay, I see that there are a couple uh, fast, uh, there are a couple questions coming up. Um, there's one, is it true that fast, so the huge radio telescope um, in China that I showed found extremely bright radio bursts from a magnetar. I remember reading it in a scientific journal and I would like to know your perspective on it. So um, fast did, I think, do follow-up observations of fast radio bursts from the magnetar that I showed. So it's the, the neutron star the, with, a huge, with a super strong magnetic field, um, but, it, but it wasn't the one that actually discovered the fast radio burst in the first place from this magnetar. Um, but, but it was really important still that they were able to follow up and see it because um, fast is a super powerful instrument. Um, so, so it was able to provide more insight um, into that and, and having more measurements from different instruments is, is always good. Okay, um, so looks like there's another question. Um, what do you think is a solution to the Fermi paradox? If the universe is so big, it is so likely to have produced intelligent life on other planets. So why haven't we met any extraterrestrials? So the Fermi paradox being that uh, we should have already seen um, sort of signals from intelligent life given, given how big the universe is. Um, this is a hard question. I think um, there are a lot of different ways that, that people answer this and, and also the discussion is still ongoing. Um, scientists that, that do do SETI work are still confused about that and, and that's the main reason that um, they're still able to get funding uh, to work on, on such kind of a niche subfield of astronomy um, is that we, we do expect to see, to see uh, extraterrestrial signals, but we haven't. Um, I think, I guess one, uh, one reason I could put forward for that is just the fact that we've been maybe our, our instruments aren't sensitive enough to what uh, the intelligent life might be emitting, not saying that there is even intelligent life, but maybe we're just not looking at the right frequencies or our telescopes aren't kind of um, crafted for uh, looking at the signal that we should be. Um, but hopefully with more time um, that will change. Um, okay. And then someone said, if grades aren't the most important, what would you suggest we do in terms of schooling afterwards? Okay, well, I can answer this question, I think from an academia trajectory standpoint. Um, I think rather than focusing so much on what your letter grade is or number grade, I guess it's, it's more important to think about uh, whether or not you like doing research in science. I think getting a taste of what scientific research is like is way more important. And, and also um, doing scientific research is a little bit less, or is a little bit harder to, I guess, quantify in terms of a grade, like how well you do it. Um, so I would say getting as much research experience as you can. and. And in your classes, of course, focusing on doing well, but at the same time, focusing on um, doing well in the sense that you absorb the most material and, and are really trying to, to learn the concepts rather than just trying to you know, get the best exam score, which doesn't necessarily uh, mean you've learned the material super well. Um, so I, I think that's what anonymous attendee 
asked, but feel free to ask a follow-up question if, if that wasn't it. Um, has being a woman in science ever added to your difficulties in your course? Um, I think that's a hard question. For me personally, I definitely say it's been sometimes hard for me to be one of the only women in the room. But luckily at McGill, uh, there's a pretty even split between women and men. It really depends on the department. Um, but I think definitely at times, uh, I remember at a conference, I had to get lunch with my research advisor and all of his, all of the other people in our group that I'd never met before. And it was like six or seven guys and just this one girl um, at lunch during my conference. And I felt kind of uncomfortable <clears throat> about that, but it wasn't that anyone um, made me feel uncomfortable. It was just sort of in my head, like, why am I this only girl? Um, but I think definitely finding a good mentor, again, sorry to bring that up, is really helpful in this um, and to see how this person has, has dealt with those things. Um, and I think scientists should make everyone feel included. So uh, it, it shouldn't add any difficulties. And, and that's why we're having this week so that we can discuss ways that it will be less difficult and um, it will be uh, to see other women's experiences in science. Um, okay, Sarah said, do you find you were able to achieve things in your personal life throughout your whole journey? Or did you find that your career to, took up too much of your time or energy? Uh, so this is a good question. I think, well, I guess, uh, I think the, um, most, one of the kind of key years for my personal life was I, I took about six months off between finishing my undergraduate degree and, um, starting grad school. And then I did an internship after that, but I took six months, six months off to travel and um, kind of explore uh, more of the world. And I think that felt like an achievement to me in my personal life. Um, I think that my career has definitely taken up time and energy that, that I wish that I, I could have committed to my personal life at times, but it's also because academia and research is pretty uh, open and you're able to work flexible hours, it's, it's allowed me to uh, devote time to my family and, and personal life in ways that I might not have in another career. So, so I think it's mixed and, and you definitely just kind of have to make sure that you find time to do both of those. Um, but I'm, I'm still learning and it's ongoing. Okay, uh, let's see. I guess, should we be ending in about two minutes? I can answer a couple more questions. Um, you can always email me if I, if I don't get to your question. Um, so tips on not letting the discouragement of teachers get to you when you are passionate about sciences. Hmm, well, don't listen to them. If they're discouraged, it's probably because science is hard and maybe they've been discouraged by their teachers. Um, so look for other resources. Um, there's great YouTube videos and, and other teachers. You can watch like full courses from other teachers that aren't as discouraging online. So maybe some supp supplementing your class learning with, with like online lectures or uh, other professors um, that you know that aren't as, as discouraging. Um, let's see, uh, I guess there's another one. What would be the pros of going into a physics major and postgraduate studies compared to going for an engineering bachelor's degree? That's an interesting question. I think that I've seen people do their physics degree in undergrad and go to graduate school in engineering and vice versa. I've seen people with even like music degrees 
um, or drama degrees in physics and then going back and taking some more physics classes and applying to grad school. So I, I think it, it doesn't necessarily need to limit you. I, I think if you do have an engineering degree, sometimes or it, it will open up more um, industry jobs maybe right away, like they'll be more easily seen. But even if you major in physics in undergrad, you can definitely fit the criteria for the engineering degrees um, anyway, or engineering jobs anyway. And you just kind of have to seek them out a little bit more. Um, but you definitely still qualify for a lot of engineering jobs. So I'd say if you're sure that you wanna go into industry, maybe then you go for the engineering bachelor. Um, how much time do I have left to the other hosts? Should I keep answering questions or? Angelica, okay. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to, to kind of start closing it off now. Okay. So yeah. uh, we'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you for coming uh, to speak with us today. Uh, mm. Your talk was very informative. It was honestly very eye-opening. And I think especially in the context of today with you know school having moved online, it was most likely very moving for a lot of us to hear your words of encouragement and to kind of keep pushing us to kind of pursue the subject that we're also passionate about. So we're now gonna open up the chat in case anybody else would like to write a couple words of thanks or even just kind of point out a couple of key takeaways that they've taken from today's talk as, as a show of gratitude. And then we'll kind of end the webinar. Oh, thanks for that nice comment, Elisabetta. Uh... Yeah, thanks so much um, for organizing this and uh, for coming, taking the time this morning. <laughs>